My name is Olia. Uh, I'm coming from Estonia. I lived, uh, have been living in London for eight years. Uh, been on and off, li traveling, living in Berlin and Brussels, and been back to Estonia. Uh, see my parents or organize events. So when I often say uh, when I'm, when people ask in where you're from, uh, um, I'm saying from a planet. <laughs> Or from, or from Earth. I'm mainly squatting. Most of the time, my, my life in London is squatting. Out, out, out of these eight years, it's uh, maybe one year of just going uh, back and forth with suitcases, maybe. <laughs> I discovered squatting as well here. I didn't know about it. And London showed me a lot of uh, new things, educated me, I would say. Um, if you want to try and challenge yourself to have um, no water for weeks no 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 running water no shower or no no electricity and that's that's how that's how what that's what you mm, encounter when you when you start squatting and you keep squatting and it's it's constantly a challenge and uh, that, that's how you also learn how to fix things, how to uh, create something by yourself. And this quite supportive community, who the squatting community, they they uh, they have meetings and and literature that explains how to how to do everything. Sometimes when I speak to people who outside squatting, uh, they they seem a bit scared. When you when you when you explain all, uh, the experiences, uh, because you need to go out out of your comfort zone and and spend a lot of time on basic things that you don't do when you when you're not squatting <laughs> when you're renting. As a woman, uh, I I see quite a lot of uh, women squatting. Um, in in London, it seems. Um, quite uh, supportive community. Um, when I moved to London, it was uh, my first time coming, uh, separating with parents, so traveling on my own. And it was uh, a will to challenge myself and to see, to explore, explore the world. So yeah, I chose London because mainly because of the music in the first place. During these eight years, I discovered uh, a lot of interesting music uh, scenes, uh, mainly underground. But I've been also uh, going out, uh, going out a lot to some to to clubs, um, following club uh, club kids, <laughs> as, as they call them. Um, yeah, and from the very beginning, uh, I would say mainly been around. Queer, queer, queer scene. My name is Simonetta Agnello Hornby. Simonetta is my name. Agnello is the name of my father. Hornby is the name of uh, my former husband. Um, when I came to England, I was very proud of being me, Simonetta Agnello and I never thought that I would take my husband's name, let alone kept it after we divorced. But I've realized over the years that names are not important. Uh, I come from Palermo, which is in Sicily, and I came to England at 17, not of my own will. I was sent by my parents in Cambridge for four months to learn English which I didn't want to learn in Sicily because I preferred French. So I came to England in 63 to stay here for, for four months to study. It was very expensive for my family, so I had to learn English. It wasn't fun. So I didn't speak to my Italian friends and I concentrated on English people, which were incredibly difficult to meet in Cambridge because they all had their own life, the undergraduates, but I managed. Um, so I made lots of friends uh, among the English and uh, one of them I fell in love with 
and I married him when I was 21. So I came to England for love and by chance. When I returned, I'd been married for four years. Uh, I was a lawyer. I'd studied in America and I worked in Zambia where my husband was. Um, and then I came back to England pregnant, so I had a baby and I started to become a solicitor. And I became a solicitor six years later, two children, and that's it. Sono Morena. Ho 27 anni, 28 quest'anno e vivo a Londra da circa tre anni e mezzo. E mi sono trasferita con il mio compagno per ragioni lavorative principalmente, per cercare una situazione un po' più stabile e per avere qualche risparmio in più rispetto a quelli che avevamo in Italia. E adesso fra cinque giorni torno in Italia per iniziare un progetto, sempre con il mio compagno, relativo alla produzione del vino. Nel frattempo, in questi quattro anni, ho studiato e sto ancora aspettando i risultati dell'esame finale, ma se tutto va bene dovrei diplomarmi col Wines and Spirit Education Trust, qui a Londra. Ciao! <ride> Questi partono da Itro, di solito. Bevete bene, bevete vino. Comunque è vero, scientificamente provato, se è rosso, se è bianco vi state inciuccando e basta. So my name is Heike Vogt, um, I'm German and British now, I uh, come from East Germany, so I grew up in East Germany and uh, before the wall came down my family moved to West Germany. I came to uh, England or to London specifically in 1995, um, so well more than 20 years ago. And I came here after I studied English in Germany and I um, just wanted to find out for a few months how my English would fare in real life situations and that was 22 years ago and here I am. Okay, so I'm from Saxony, this is this part here, um, so there's Dresden um, and a little bit further south, uh, south e southwest there's Chemnitz and there's a little place near Chemnitz called Frankenberg. So it's fairly close to the Czech border. Um, and my family moved in 1984, so before the wall came down, and we moved to Nuremberg. So we have had family in, in Nuremberg in Franconia or Bavaria for a long time. And my family now lives uh, in and around Nuremberg, um, so places like Fürth and Altdorf, so just around this area. And now, <laughs> this is the UK, and I'm in London. <laughs> Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I was always kind of anxious when, when, when people call me woman. <laughs> when I was small, uh, really, really small, I was questioning myself why I'm not a boy. But, um, but uh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely just, just a woman. <laughs> so, but I, I like to f fantasize and think I'm um, neither, 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 or just, just alien or something. <laughs> pe people call me a, a, a artist because, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think I'm still develop developing into something, into something. <laughs> I noticed while while being in the music scene here in London, I noticed there are obviously not not enough uh, girl girl music artists. Although I actually met quite a few uh, women artists, but it's obvious that it's male dominated. Yeah. Um, as for me, it I would say it, it it has been difficult. It was a little bit difficult. Um, I just knew that I need to be uh, going forward <laughs> and just try, try and try again to establish myself uh, between in, in the in the scene um, where it's mainly male, male dominated. So yeah, the most difficult was to to play at uh, the raves. The first my, my first experience was was a bit weird because. I just came there and played, and uh, all the guys were just were not wel welcoming, I would say. 
um, not all the guys, but but the vibe was kind of kind of like that. <laughs> Quando siamo partiti per Londra c'era molta paura eh, de, di quello che alla fine non si conosce. Eh, avevamo paura di, di essere gli ultimi arrivati, di non combinare niente. E invece ti rendi conto che è molto facile venire all'estero, che sia Londra, che sia qualche altra capitale, soprattutto quando vieni da una realtà italiana provinciale, ti apre gli occhi al mondo. Ero ho avuto anche dei ruoli manageriali ed ero rispettata in quanto manager e nessuno diceva oh è un manager ma è anche una ragazza quella cosa non, non influiva né più né meno su, su quello che facevo uh, l'indipendenza deriva puramente da un fatto economico per quanto è stata la mia esperienza uh, ti ritrovi in Italia a dover chiedere da garante ai tuoi genitori piuttosto che a parenti uh, anche per prendere una casa in affitto. Quanto donna mi riempirebbe di orgoglio dire cosa fai di mestiere, io sono un'imprenditrice, c'è bisogno a questo mondo di imprenditrici, di, eh, di donne presenti su più fronti eh, se vogliamo portare avanti questa cosa del femminismo. E sta al cambio di mentalità delle donne in primis. But that was the time of Women's Lib, it was 69-70. I became very active in the Women's Liberations Movement, which was fascinating, full of hopes and happiness. But I disagreed soon with them. I was looked down because I was pregnant. Uh, you shouldn't have done it. Um, we were very rigid. We became political with a little p and a very ignorant p. We would support any revolution. There had been the revolution of, um, in Iran of the Ayatollah, and they thought it was great. Uh, but you know, whenever I said, were you also in support of the revolution of Pinochet? Oh, that's different. Very naive. Um, and certainly when I was pregnant for the second time, intelligent women would say, yet again? So, You know, we did a lot and we needed to, and I went on marches, my children went on marches. Um, I think the major issues to me was the right to have an abortion. And we did manage, and I did go on the marches with my children on that. Uh, and I was very active. But I always thought that sometimes the 68 and the early 70s were very mature. In order to be admitted as a student, I had to be interviewed by a panel of five solicitors, members of the Law Society. I was pregnant and they were very kind. You know, they offered you know, a glass of water, a seat. And the questions were so offensive. Why do you want to practice in England? And I said, as I've written, I live with my husband in Oxford. I have a child, I've got another one on the way. This is my country. Um, then they would say, do you read newspapers, Mrs. Hornby? And I said, yes, which ones? And it was the Times and the Morning Star that confused them. One of them says, we do like our solicitors to be informed of what happens in every day's life. I said, that's fine. And then another one says, may I ask you again, why don't you practice in Italy? And I thought, either I get up and go, or I yell at them, or I keep quiet. And when I become a solicitor, I will be at their place in 10 years' time. And I chose the last one. And I said, commuting is complicated from Italy. Oh, yes, of course, Mrs. Zombie, yes, of course. And then somebody said, where did you learn English? And it was Cambridge. And they all woke up. Perhaps you met Mr. Hornby there? They wanted to know which college was my husband, what was he studying, what subjects he took, why he went to America, why was he in Oxford. It was all about him. And 10 years later, I was not in that place. 15, yes. I think Italian women, if anything, have become much more modern than uh, the English woman. I know more Italian women in Sicily who had children out of wedlock than in England at that period. Uh, I think 
for us in Sicily, the revolution was so enormous that we embraced it and our parents and society were aghast that didn't know how to answer. Here, society knew how to answer because they'd had the suffragettes, they had had before. So those who were against were quick to act against. Those who were in favour or didn't particularly care, let it go. Um, in England, and it is disgraceful, disgraceful, a married woman had to ask her husband to sign her own tax declaration until the time of Mrs Thatcher. She did it. She asked her husband to, t to sign it. Only later that was changed. In England, a married woman changed the passport. The name changed. In England, a married woman was called Mrs John Martin Hornby, in my case. My name had gone. So England, in many ways, was much more backward Mar for married women. Single women were more independent in England. The spinster was a reality because there were the colonies, men went, uh, there were wars. Um, so the single woman had a role, but was a, a stereotype. Usually stern, not pretty, um, a fighter. Uh, the Mary Poppins or that. So that was the difference. But, you know, we're still in the early days um, of equality. And a social pressure to conform to any standards, I found it more pronounced here, to be very honest. Um, so, for example, you have in London, especially you have the fashion industry, um, people take um, pride in their appearance. There is a lot of beauty standards that you should conform to. There is. Um, gyms and all that kind of stuff. So there is this sort of, there is in London there is the drive for people to to perfect themselves, especially for women to constantly be slim and all that. I mean, that you, you get that a bit more in London, I think. You don't have to um, go with it. Obviously, it's always your choice. But um, in Germany, especially I'm from East Germany, and it, it's much different. I mean, I grew up in East Germany under communism, so to speak. And uh, it was good for women, by and large. And I, I come from that environment where every woman worked, um, uh, you know, if you put on too much makeup, you were looked as a clown, looked at as a clown, like, why are you doing that? It's so unnecessary, you know? It's it's almost the, the, the standard of womanhood was more robust. It was more like you go out there and work and, and you just, you know, you fulfill your role and you do, you do what's good for society. It's not so much about yourself all the time. And I think um, London and probably a lot of other Western cities, they are, they are very much about um, introspection and you know, self-fulfillment and yoga and meditation and all that kind of stuff. And this can get quite stressful. So I, I, I did, I did, I was in that in that world for a few years in the past, and and it's it's quite stressful, you know. Yeah. So the pressure about having a family or settling down, um, I I never felt that very much, uh, simply because the way I was brought up, uh, my parents were very liberal in the best sense of the word. So my my. My dad in particular, he they never treated me as the little girl who had to do certain things. I mean, I think they expected this to happen. It didn't happen. I'm 46 years old now and I've only just now got engaged. Um, but it's great. It's a great time in my life. Um, I, I enjoyed my life so far. I did, uh, I did what I wanted to do. I'm here. I mean, this is the place where you can really do this, where you can have a meaningful career. You can travel, you can do whatever else you want to do. And... Um, I personally never really felt the pressure to have children. For example, I love kids, but I um, personally never felt that I had to have them to be happy. Um, I always wanted to marry, um, and now it looks like it's going to happen. <laughs>ma tanto per essere straniera eh, e il problema è che do dopo il discorso della Brexit chiunque avesse un minimo di pudore nel, nel dar voce a pensieri che magari non ne avevano bisogno adesso si sente nel diritto e neanche nel, quasi nel dovere di, di condividere eh, pensieri xenofobi piuttosto che eh, quindi ho avuto diversi episodi, mi è capitato quando ero capocassa lavorando in un negozio di abbigliamento che la, di fronte a un rifiuto per eh, un rimborso la cliente mi avesse chiesto di parlare con un manager inglese, 
Peccato che su 40 dipendenti del negozio le uniche due persone inglesi erano dei part time a 20 ore che lavoravano solamente nei weekend e quindi ovviamente lei aveva davanti tutta l'Europa tranne l'Inghilterra. Come nei romanzi si dice non ti rendi conto di quello che hai lasciato finché non ce l'hai più, eh, devo dire che io non mi sono mai riscoperta così nazionalista come da quando sono a Londra. Eh, sono partita dall'Italia pensando che l'erba del vicino era sempre più verde eh, e invece mi sono ricreduta tantissimo. Sono um, estoniana by, by passport, ma sono russian speaking estoniana. E uh, especially since I've been living here for eight years, been out of that, I feel more and more not really related to. Estonia. I would say I'm European. It's, it's just may, maybe uh, because I've been mainly living in Europe most all my life. <laughs> Definitely uh, I'm not gonna stay here. I'm, I'm moving, moving out quite soon. And it's not the first time I'm, I'm living in London. It, it kind of su 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 sucks you in sometimes. Uh, it just happens. But in terms of Brexit, I see that like many people are already leaving and mm, for me the main reason is that it becomes more expensive. In general, it's just always a high pace of, of, this, of, of any lifestyle. Which, whichever lifestyle you live in London is, is get affected by this crazy mm, machine money making machine people are always running somewhere and you don't don't you don't feel you don't feel like you you have enough time to rest and that is very needed some people come here and they see, they, they they just straight away go away uh, and some people like like me maybe i wanted to feel i wanted to experience that craziness of everyday life but uh, it's time like at the moment uh, I feel like it's time to change something to go relax <laughs> okay so I wanted to be a British citizen um, because I had in my mind I had this 20 year threshold um, I knew that in the past you could do this after five years but I thought oh I wasn't really decided and it is a big thing I don't take it uh, I, I take it seriously because I don't just do it so I can stay here and have no troubles. I, to me, it really means something because you have to s say an oath, you have to sort of, um, you have to promise certain things. And, and to me, that's very meaningful, the words in themselves. And I knew that if I wanted, if I were here for 20 years, I probably would stay. And I hit the 20 year threshold and then kind of Brexit came about. So uh, around at the same time. And then I, I really did this and I found the process quite easy. The only thing that I found a little bit difficult was as a EU citizen you had to first of all apply for a permanent residency which is a little discriminatory against EU citizens but there we are. Uh, and then the process itself, the passport process, I was very happy with that. It was very quick. Um, I had a private ceremony um, so that was really lovely that I could do this with my friends and my families. My parents came over and It was a very meaningful day for me. It was in January this year and I'm, I'm very happy and very proud that I did it. But it's not primarily of Brexit, it just coincided with that. Um, second nationality, whether it has changed my identity, I don't think so. I've always been, I felt very privileged to be German because, especially growing up in this, in this time where a lot of German history changed, where the wall came down and I, I really remember that quite well. Um, but also I, I love being British. I think I'm very proud of that. I, I think England is the most beautiful country on the planet and I really think I'm right about that. <laughs> um, and it hasn't changed anything other than um, it, I think it's great that I can have both. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm very grateful that I can have both. But um, yeah, it hasn't changed a lot of things other than that. So um, in terms of being discriminated against um, on account of my nationality or anything else, no, uh, absolutely not. Um, usually I I say no and then people go well but you live in London and obviously that doesn't happen here but I've been uh, traveling England you know far and wide I really love England and it's never I mean never once happened to me and in particular because I'm German and um, you can hear that I'm German I've never really lost my accent um, I've never had any um, any 
snarky remarks or anything. I mean, the, the only thing that's happening is that I have a lot of friends who who like a good Hitler joke and they will tell me the Hitler joke, you know. <laughs> but I think that doesn't really count as discrimination. So no, not at all. I do feel part of these two specific countries. I think feeling citizen of Europe, I've never really understood that. I, I, do, know, I do know people who feel like that. I, it never worked for me. I, I am a believer in the nation state and there are specific characteristics attached to every country in Europe. And I think that's great. The differences are fantastic. The only time I struggle is obviously when we play football, um, Germany versus England. And I would probably feel very torn. But other than that, no. <laughs> My feelings towards Brexit are incredibly positive. Um, I, I, I was crying for joy when it happened. I really, I remember I stayed up all night and I hoped this would really come through. And then uh, I remember, remember the moment when they said it now is statistically or mathematically impossible that it cannot happen. I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I think it's a fantastic thing to happen. I know that um, obviously it's kind of divided the country to some extent. Um, but I think it's brilliant because it's really a new beginning. It feels like a new start. I don't think it'll be very easy. I think there'll be some problems. Um, but I think it's a fantastic way for the country forward. And especially, I think it's very suitable for the for Great Britain to do this for the UK because this is the oldest democracy in Europe. And it's, it's brilliant that they kind of blaze the trail uh, in a way. I think the EU as such, currently as it is, is not very good news for poorer countries. Um, uh, I think it can be quite bureaucratic. I don't think it has fulfilled the expectations that mm, citizens might have had in it. Uh, and I think it needs, at least it needs a restart, if not a complete reordering. Um, so I would expect more countries to follow the UK. Brexit will not affect my life because I realised that Britain might live um, in 1999 when it refused um, to consider adopting the euro. It was very clear to me that there would be great difficulties. So I became British. I didn't want to become British before because there was no need. Um, because Britain had gone into the European community, I could actually practice as a solicitor. Uh, but if uh, Britain left, I would immediately be unable to do my job. And at that time, I was also a part-time judge and that would have gone as well. So I applied to become British with two Italian friends and, um, and we became British in about two or three months. Now, my four grandchildren have asked their parents to become Italian. Brexit, uh, Brexit I think it's potentially a disaster, but Europe is not working well. So Europe is a disaster. Um, we enlarged it too quickly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. We didn't look at the background and where the new countries came. We never, I think, supported sufficiently the immigrants who came from other countries at the level of institutions of the country where you stay, right to work, how to live, how is another culture. Uh, it's a great tragedy for Europe. And I think that um, Britain may stay, I think it's unlikely, because there is a tremendous amount of stupidity in all the politicians in Europe.